but um, Josh, Josh is fully capable. <laughs> so we'll be, Josh is going to bring us this chapter today, and um, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be good for our souls. And so let me pray, and we'll get Josh started here. Father, uh, help us to, to feel uh, what the Apostle Paul was feeling as he went through this, what this chapter tells this us. Guy. And uh, we just love the Apostle Paul, and we thank you. He's such a gift to us, Lord God, and help us to be inspired by him and emulate him. I pray you be with each one as we open our hearts to the word now, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Paul, I'm going to be talking about Paul as he's being an amazing missionary, traveling and getting hurt and all that while I'm sitting in my luscious office chair so feels a little <laughs> off but yeah all right acts 14 so we had just they are we got paul and barnabas on their missionary journey sent out by the spirit to minister to gentiles across the area so we'll start in acts 14 and in iconium they entered the synagogue of the jews together if you don't know, Iconium and a lot of the cities they're going to be visiting, they're kind of in southern Turkey, I think is the best way to describe it. Like the the southern, like where, the, where Turkey kind of extends over the the Mediterranean Ocean, it, the, it right down above the water, right above Cyprus, there's a bunch of cities that they're going to visit right now in Turkey. And uh, Antioch, which is where they were sent out from, is in Syria, north of Israel. And so they've been sent out to Turkey area, all the cities in that area, to help people up there and preach God up there. In Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together. <laughs> I've, I've only made it 10 words in, and i got to talk about that. <laughs> they, they show up to this town. And they go straight to the synagogue. And when I think of doing something like that, I'm terrified because I don't, I have no idea. Like if I went into a, into like a Jewish synagogue up in, in New Britain, I would be panicked. I'd be terrified because I have no idea what's going on. But for these guys, it's, there's no problem. Paul grew up Jewish. Barnabas, I'm assuming, did too. They know a synagogue. They know how it all works. So they head straight there. They know how to deal with this. They head in. They head straight in. And God has equipped us to minister to people in different ways. We have our own backgrounds. We have our giftings, our ways. And yes, we yes we can minister to people that don't match our backgrounds. But God has equipped us to use our history, our life that he has redeemed us from to minister to people that are in the same place. And so he's doing that with these guys. They also went in together. They <laughs> went in together. They did not do this alone. We need help. <laughs> we really need help to do what God wants us to do. And spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. Here we have God speaking through them, the Holy Spirit speaking through them. And because of that, they're bringing a lot of people to God. They are blessing a lot of people with their words and administering. Verse 2, But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. We have whatever Jews decided that they didn't like these guys, that they were going to where they were going to get the Greeks and whatever people in the area were Gentiles against them. And it's curious, we have now Jews. Typically, we'll see that theme. We've seen that theme all over the place. Where it's the Jews who are constantly in opposition to the work of God, to, to Christianity moving forward. Ironically, the, God's chosen people are the ones who oppose it the most in early church history. <laughs> They're the ones that stand against it most powerfully. and they it doesn't make sense because it feels like all the other religions all the other peoples should be against it but it's the jews it's the jews who go out of their way 
to stand against Christianity more than tell other people about God than the Christians are actually doing. And it's so on its head and so backwards. But Paul and Barnabas just keep going. Verse 3, Therefore they spent a long time there, speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord. So because of what the Jews did, they had to spend a while there. But it didn't matter. They did it, they were bold, and they trusted on the Lord, who was testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. God was giving them the ability to heal and show signs and wonders to, as a testimony to God's grace. And I love the wording in that. Who was test the Lord, who was testifying to the word of his grace granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. Healing is such grace. Healing is tremendous grace. We have a God who just pours his healing on us when it doesn't make sense. It was, it was the man's fault that evil entered the world, that sickness, that death entered the world. Adam and Eve took the fruit. It was man's fault. God had nothing to do with it. So if God continued wanting to have nothing to do with it, he could. But he doesn't. He sends his grace down and heals over and over again, especially in this time. That is a mark of his grace where there's no reason that we deserve that healing at all. Yet he sends it. He sends that grace down. And so that is a testimony of his grace. Whenever people are healed, that is God's grace moving. But the people of the city were divided. And some sided with the Jews, and some with the apostles. We got a huge division in this town brought by Paul and Barnabas. And when we preach God, and when we're bold about God in our friend groups, in our work, it'll cause division, typically, because people realize what's going on, that their their life is being challenged, being changed, and people are scared of change or love the life that they're living and don't want anything different with it. And so when we confront that as Christians, when we move in the spirit and help people see that Jesus loves them and that there's such a better life for them in God, that requires a little suffering now and a lot of joy later. People don't like that sometimes. And it causes division. And we see that here. Some cited with the Jews and some of the apostles. Verse 5. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Lysania, Lystra, and Derbe in the surrounding region. They had multiple attempts to kill them. (laughs) That's how great the division was against them. That's how great the plot was. Multiple attempts on their life. And... Rightly, they decided it's time to let things cool down. So they pulled back, but they weren't done. These towns, Lycaonia, Lystra, and Derbe, they they surround Iconium. They they're kind of below it in like a crescent shape. So they they just left the left a little bit. Like Lystra, which they're heading first, it's only like twenty miles away. It's like distance from here to Yukon. They just they just went a little ways away, just letting Iconium cool down a bit. And then they're ministering to other towns. Verse 7, And there they continued to preach the gospel. They did not give up. They were not done. They were persistent. They saw God wanted to move. And so they spoke out boldly, caused great division, took a break when it was time to take a break, and moved on to other regions that also needed to hear. And sometimes God can use that when something is set against us or there's a roadblock in our way, God might say, all right, it's time to move on for a bit. And we just got to listen and move on to the next thing and keep going. Verse eight, at Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. 
and he leaped up and began to walk. So we have, just like we talked about in the previous uh, story at Iconium, God is using his testifying of his grace through healing. And Paul, seeing an opportunity in someone to heal them, which requires faith, as we see in this, heals them and brings testimony to God because of it. And there is a big element of faith whenever we want to be healed. When we pray for healing, when you're praying for healing at night before bed or whatever you're doing, look expectantly. We got to look expectantly whenever we pray for God to do something. We don't want to pray out of repetition. We don't want to pray out of tradition. We want to pray out of truly understanding that we serve a God who can heal and who wants to heal. And it may not happen. I, mom told me this story of this guy, Greg Laurie. He's a pastor. And he had a kind of a distant, uh, he like lost his stepfather when he was young. And so he found him again when he was an adult. And, and found him in New York, went to him. His father was very excited to see him. And Greg Laurie told him his story of his life, what had happened. And his father just silently listened and wasn't saved. And just listen to Greg Glory's story, powerful story of salvation. So his stepfather said, let's go for a walk the next tomorrow morning. They go for a walk. And his father said, I want to get saved. And Greg Glory's like, yeah. So they pray. And then after they're done doing that, his stepfather says, I had a, a heart problem, a really bad heart problem. I think I, I think he had a heart attack two weeks prior. Could you pray for me? And Greg Glory's like, well, I can, but that doesn't mean you're going to get healed. And his stepfather's like, yeah, yeah, okay. Let's pray for me. So they pray. And his stepfather's like, my heart doctor's right there. Let's go see what's up. And Greg Laurie's like, well, hold on. That doesn't mean you got healed. So his father's <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. So they go in and the doctor looks at his heart. His heart's completely fine. And there's that power of faith, of believing that God can do something. And that's what Paul was looking for. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand up right on your feet. It took that little bit of faith. When Paul saw he had faith, he was like, okay, here's an opportunity. Stand up. And God used that to be a testimony. And so, again, we don't look for healing. We look for our, our name to be written in heaven and on God's heart. But when we pray and when we ask for things in life, we got to believe that God can do them. We got to have that little bit of faith. But something not so great happens because of this. 11. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Lycenaean language, the gods have, come, have become like men and have come down to us. So they're mistaking Paul for a god. Verse 12. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. So we have this town, Lystra, who is brimming with, I guess you could call it superstition. They want to believe in something so bad that as soon as they see a miracle like this, they're ready to declare these guys as gods. They are just potently ready to receive spiritual things to ready to receive things that they don't understand and most people are we all have that desire i think to have an encounter with something supernatural that we can't explain almost everyone does i remember as a kid i wanted to look at all kinds of horror games and crazy stories of of some dude on youtube saying like he was dark in the room when this, when the lampshade started, we, you want those encounters. I think I've, I've not known a single kid in the youth group that hasn't wanted to encounter spiritual things like that. And this town is brimming with that. So as soon as something like this healing comes, they're ready. They jump on it head first and to their detriment. And so now Paul and Barnabas got a backpedal. Verse 15 or sorry, 14. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Hall, sorry, Barnabas and Paul heard of it. 
they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out. Paul and Barnabas have the right thing. As soon as they discover that this is going on, they didn't understand it at first because it's in a different language. As soon as they discover this is happening, they rush out to make sure people understand that it was not them that was doing this. Verse 15, and saying, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you. And preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, and yet he did not leave himself without witness, in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even saying these things with difficulty, they restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. This, this quote is beautiful, by the way. I, I want to talk about the, the story, but the, the quote that they spoke on, on God and on them being men is beautiful and talking about how God let us do our own thing and go our own way, but he didn't leave us without a witness of his goodness in our life where he provides the rain and the food that we eat yep. is a, an amazing thing. But I want to talk about how they did this amazing thing and the crowds were ready to elate them and elevate them. And that can happen when we move with God. We look pretty good. We look amazing. When God is moving through us, when we've come to that point of God speaking through us and we're doing amazing things and helping people through dark moments in life, we start to look pretty good and people start to value us and elevate us highly. And we have to be careful that we make sure people understand it's from God. All the good we're doing is from God and not from us, that we are on the same level as they are. Because this can happen where Paul and Barnabas were elevated to godhood and people were ready to offer sacrifices to them and praise them and that is dangerous if we if you walk into that and accept that and just move on that is not what god wants he wants all the attention on him and that's what it should be and so as we're moving in god as we follow the spirit we got to be careful to not accept too much praise too much of the glory we got to take that glory and make sure people point it to God. Just like I do singing on Sundays, I have no idea most of the time how I do that. I'm serious because sometimes my voice is dead or there have been moments where I have been so exhausted that I could hardly get up, but I relied on God. And as soon as I came in, this something filled me and I was able to do it in strength and then afterwards, people come up and they're like, that was amazing. You're an amazing singer. And I have to say, nope, was not me. That was God moving through me. We have to make sure that the glory is centered on God as we move in the spirit, as we move in his works, that we are not to be praised. Yes, it is, it is good to praise people and encourage them and say, you yielded to God. Good job. But we shouldn't be boasting and we shouldn't sort of take hold of the glory. We should let that go to God where it belongs, where all good things come from, just like they're doing here. And this, this little snippet from Paul is a fantastic snippet for understanding all that God did, all that God did. It is so powerful for the Gentiles of this time. It summarizes all of human history and all that God wants to do in like a few sentences. And it blows me away reading it. And so that sentence, I'm sure, was not from thought up by Paul and Barnabas in that instant. I'm sure God spoke that through them. And God can do that through us. Verse 19. But the Jews came from Antioch 
and Iconium, and having won over the crowds. Hold on a second. But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. Antioch is in Syria. This is a long... Okay, I don't know if you know G Middle Eastern geography, but Turkey, we got Turkey, and then we got Israel over here. And that's a long trip from Antioch to the region of Turkey that they're in. That is a long journey. We have Jews traveling from Antioch to oppose them. That's a long trip to oppose these guys. They are so messed up that they're spending so much time opposing God's word, Christianity going out. They had such great opposition, Paul and Barnabas did, doing this. That they had guys coming from other Jewish people coming from miles, hundreds, more than 100 miles away to come and counter them. But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. <laughs> so there were a lot of people. I don't know if nobody's been stoned. I haven't been. I assume it's pretty painful, though where they take rocks and throw them at you until you die, that Paul went through that. And then he was dragged out of the city and left for dead. And they thought he was dead. But then he just gets up and walks back in the city. There's two miracles here. One, a lot of people saw Paul. And so it's, it would be hard for him to just have survived this stoning this wasn't an uncommon practice it would have been very hard for him to make it through this without someone saying oh he's still breathing and then they go to town on him more so he was probably very messed up but he gets on his feet and walks back in the city that is blowing away. that blows me away that god did that just healed him in an instant another thing is that he walked back in the city the city that just stoned him to death. He walks back in it. <laughs> the same place. He goes right back in. That speaks forgiveness. And Paul was able to do it probably best of all because he had been persecuting Christians so much that he was ready to forgive. He, there's another verse that says, he who has been forgiven much forgives. And Paul was ready. He was able to forgive so easily. In this, well, I'm sure it wasn't easy, <laughs> but God brought him through that so that he was ready to forgive, so that the experience he had been through helped him let go and helped him keep ministering to people. Again, God can use evil stuff in our life, the experiences we've been through, to prepare us for the work he has for us. And he did that with Paul. He had stoned a lot of Christians, and so now he himself is being stoned. And as soon as that's done, he gets right back up and goes back to the people that stoned him. While, but while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day, he went away with Barnabas to Derbe. That was another town in that same region. Verse 21. After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. They get that more than anyone. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. <laughs> A lot's got to happen, but it's good. A lot of terrible things took place, but they're good. They understood that. Verse 23. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. This is a, this is a common thing, appointing elders in the church to guide and to lead. And there's no talk of pastors. There's no talk of priests. There's talk of elders and the church being this thing. And so my dad is kind of that image of an elder, of someone wise, experienced to guide us, to help us through this life. 
to give us advice when we don't know what we're doing next, <laughs> to, to help us through our failures and through our sicknesses or our unbelief. He's the elder. And we have other people in the church too that are people I look to, others look to, that are wise, that are, have been through life and followed God and been strong, that we look to for our understanding in what God wants to do in these periods in life. Kathy Vinci is someone like that, who she prays and prays and prays and has been through life, a hard life, but she believes in God and she knows that he's real. And so if you ask her for help on something, man, she'll give you a good answer. She will pray for you. She will say, this is what you need to do. Let's pray. That's right. And it is beautiful. And there are pointing elders here, people that they believe can guide younger generations, people, people younger than them, in how to live life, how to make it through life, because they have been through life, probably because they've made a lot of mistakes themselves, and because they've chosen to follow God. Verse 24, they passed through Sidia and came into Pamphylia. When they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. Italia is a little town on the coast. From there, they sailed to Antioch, from which they had been commanded to the grace of God for the work that they had accomplished. This comes full circle here. Their whole, Paul and Barnabas' whole journey, leaving from Antioch all the way up, ministering to all the Gentiles in, north of, in Syria, north of Syria, Turkey. It all comes full circle now. They're heading back. Verse 27, when they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all the things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles, and they spent a long time with the disciples. They recounted all that they had experienced. Missionaries do that to us now, and it's powerful when people come and it share what's been going on, the vonerias, when they talked about what they've been up to. We've got missionaries everywhere, in Italy, in places in the Pacific Ocean, on islands with people that have never heard God. When they come back and say, this is what God is doing, it's inspiring. I have I remember those experiences all through my life of missionaries coming and talking about the work of God. And it's important to do that. It's very important to talk about what God is doing because it's so easy to despair and say, oh, God's not doing anything. There's no, this isn't working. No, it is. It's working. It is happening. And when missionaries come back, it is a powerful thing because they talk about all the amazing things God doing, God is doing, all the salvation he is bringing to people. And so it is important whenever we have encounters, whenever we have people come to God through our own life, it's important to come back into the church and say, this is the success I've experienced and inspire other people in the church to do the same thing, to go out. And be strong and speak boldly as Paul and Barnabas did. Not afraid of getting hurt, knowing that God will be speaking through us. So, that's Paul and Barnabas. Duh. Beautiful, Josh. You brought us through. Wonderful. And uh, I want to pick out a few points. Uh, Bob's not here, so I'll take his time too. <laughs> so, I'll do a little more than <laughs> more, maybe. <laughs> But uh, I think, uh, you know, like some people consider Acts just history and you can't get much out of it. But to me, it is so rich mm. with how I'm supposed to do things. And we are, in, in a sense, apostolic. In other words, we want to model our church today after the early church. We don't want to make up how it should be. We want to look at how it was and we want to be like that. That's called an apostolic uh, theology or, or church. And so I'm learning a ton from the book of Acts and I'm learning how to minister and how to be a Christian. And the first thing I want to pick up in chapter 14, it's uh, really interested. Um, it says the Jews who disbelieved in verse two stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. So here they were mad and they were bitter. Um, but then in verse three, it says, therefore, they spent a long time there speaking boldly. In other words, even though the Jews were mad, 
They might have incited the politicians, you know, like elsewhere. They didn't move very fast. They, they kind of took their time, even though they were mad, they were bitter, and they were going to come against Paul. And I see Paul using this to his advantage. He didn't run away. He didn't say, oh, they're mad at me. They might do something. He said, I am going to get every minute of preaching I can to this person, to these people, and I'm going to wait till they act upon me physically. Yeah. And I, I have had my run-ins with the town, with the Board of Zoning and Appeals and uh, uh, Appeal Board and all the rest. And I, I, I take this disposition like, OK, I'm going forward with the gospel until they act upon me. <laughs> because I'm not just going to live scared. I'm not just going to live that they might do so. Even if I hear that they're mad, you know, uh, the gospel has to go forward. And we don't want to be smothered and stifled and um, uh, have a wet blanket put on us by fear in us just because we think Aunt Bessie's going to come and yell at me for talking to my brother Joe about the Lord. No, we talk, even though there's threats around us, we keep going forward with the gospel. And if worse comes to worse and we get the tar beat out of us, which doesn't happen today, really to us, I don't think any of us had, have had that experience, um, we're going to keep talking. Even if people are threatening us like, yeah, okay, you got your opinion. Now let me get back to talking the gospel to this person. So I see that first of all here, and I love Paul for it. I love Paul is bold, filled with the Holy Spirit. He knows in whom he has believed, and he is plowing forward through the storms, and no matter what comes his way, he's going forward. So I really like that. Um, first of all, I want to mention that. And then next, um, excuse me, on healing, in verse 9, there's a wonderful phrase there that I think we need to pay attention to. It says that when he had fixed his gaze upon him and had seen that he had faith to be made well. Now, what did he see? Like, like it, it just, it points to me that maybe the person I'm going to pray for, for healing, I don't just automatically say, oh, I'm sick. I need to be healed. Okay, I'll pray for you and I'll pray for you. Maybe I need to see something in the person I'm going to pray for, for healing. Maybe I should expect something from that person before I pray for healing for them. And so I might ask a person, do you believe God could heal you? Do you believe in Jesus? Or, or something that just anyone walking up to me and they're sick and they want to be healed, they're leaving out the healer. They just want the healing. It's all right in this passage, I think, to look at them and say, well, do I see faith in this person? Because that's exactly what Paul was looking for here. He had seen that he had faith to be made well. And so I just want to bring that out as we are called to pray for other people for healing. We don't have to do that automatically. We can ask them a few questions before we pray. And I even do that at the altar sometimes. I ask, do you believe God could heal you? I want to see, I want to bring out this faith before I pray for a person. All right. And then uh, Josh mentioned it. But what I always kind of wondered was like, you know, like they're calling them Zeus and Hermes. And why didn't they just um, shut this down more quickly? They already got a sacrifice going. The priest came. Uh, they had a they had a um, a temple to Zeus at the gate of the city it was farther out outside the city. So he had to come in, bring sacrifice. Like, why would why didn't they just jump right on this? It's because I think they didn't understand that what was happening. And Josh mentioned it. Say, and and why would Luke write in verse 11? Uh Paul, what Paul had done, they raised their voice saying in the Lycomian language. 
Paul and Barnabas wouldn't have understood the Lycomian language. It was unique to itself away from other things. So they're like scrambling around, talking in their own language. They're all excited. And Paul and Barnabas are probably sitting there. Oh, this is awesome. They're all excited about the Lord. And next time, the next thing they know, here comes the priest from Zeus up with the sacrifice. And they're bowing down to Paul. They're like, wait a minute. This is going off the rails. They don't understand the same thing we're understanding. We're preaching the gospel and they're getting some totally different thing out of this. And that could happen. The effect we want when we preach the gospel could have the complete opposite effect on someone. Sometimes when I'm sharing the gospel with someone, they'll go, you're, you're right. I need to go back to the Catholic church or I need to get more spiritual or I need to, you know, I need to do better. And, and the result I want is for them to humble themselves and apologize to God for their sin But the response I get is like, okay, I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to really try to be righteous. And I'm, I'm, it's like the opposite effect of what we want. And uh, so they tried to stop them here. They tore their robes, which means that's a, that's a sign of horror. It's like, oh, oh Lord, what happened here? You know, they're just like, oh, Oh, what's going on? This is the opposite of what we wanted. And and we have to remember, we're going to take our lumps when we follow God. People are not going to respond to us like we want them to all the time. It happens in business. It happens with our spouse. um, It happens with everybody. They don't respond like we want them to. And we can anticipate that when we're bringing the gospel to people. Crazy things like this could happen. And so we, we want to realize that these Lyconians were probably not Jews. They didn't have a background in the Old Testament. So Paul is preaching to them from nature, from natural theology. And we know in Romans it says that we'll be without excuse because we can see God all around us the heavens declare the glory of God. Now, we don't know the specifics of the the Messiah coming, but we can know um, there is one creator. And before Paul can talk about a savior, he has to talk about there's not 25 gods, there's not Hermes and Zeus and all the rest of your gods, there's one God. And he created all of this. So he's starting... It's a different starting point when we're talking to a Jewish person or a Roman Catholic person or or someone who just is totally heathenistic, totally pagan. They have no idea that there's even just one God. So Paul is this is his jumping in point where he's saying, "Okay, guys, let's start from the basic. There's one God and he created things and you've been enjoying his blessings all this time. So so that's a good note there, I think, as well. And um, so even when there was a riot, even when they were rising up, he said, look, we're not Zeus, we're not Hermes. And by the way, um, Paul was the spokesman, so he got his God. Barnabas got Zeus because Barnabas was probably taller and good looking and all that stuff. Paul was kind of not so good looking maybe, but he was the mouthpiece, so he got Hermes. I want to read you something. Um, from it, it, it's it's not scripture. It was written in about 150 AD, and it's a letter called the Acts of Paul. It's not scripture, but it can help us see what they were thinking shortly after the gospel, the canon was closed. And it, it says this: There, one Onesiphorus, a resident of Iconium, sets out to meet Paul who was on his way to the city. And he saw Paul approaching, a man of small of stature, with a bald head and crooked legs, in a good state of body, with eyebrows meeting and nose somewhat hooked, full of friendliness, for now he appeared like a man, and now he had the face of an angel. So we have sort of this, description we don't know it could have been just 
someone writing what they thought, but it's the closest thing we have as to the description of Paul. He was not impressive. <laughs> you know what? We don't have to be bodybuilders. We don't have to be beauty queens. As a matter of fact, one of the people in my life, um, his name was Charles Grandison Finney. He was a great revivalist. There was a picture of him I saw, and he was pretty ugly. And his wife was even uglier. And I and I looked at that picture and I thought to myself, God has this is before I was called into ministry. I looked at it. I said, God has used this man and his wife so greatly. It humbled me to think that I sort of thought I had to be nice looking for people and kind of in shape for people and kind of that people don't really care about us. <laughs> they want to hear the gospel, and we're not here to show them Scott, Pastor Scott. We're here to show them Jesus. Yeah. And the Apostle Paul was this crook-nosed, bent-over little guy with, 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 with legs that or nobody it didn't impress anybody. But what impressed him was that Paul was so sold out to the gospel. There was like complete 100%, I'm in this thing, and you need to be in it too. And, and that's an inspiration to me. So while they came against him, again, the same thing. They were um, they were going to hurt him. They were going to do up. And what did Paul, Paul do? He kept preaching the gospel. And this time, he convinced them not to hurt him. <laughs> so, so we have in, in 17, um, let me see. Uh, yet he didn't, he's preaching, he continues to preach. It didn't leave him without a witness that he did good, gave you rains in heaven and fruitful seasons. Verse 18, and even saying these things, they with difficulty restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. So, so Paul kept talking. Even when the, they were pushing back and they were going to sacrifice and all, and the, the crowd was mad at them. He kept talking and he calmed him down because he, he didn't give up. And they, okay, they settled back. And it wasn't until the Jews came from Antioch and again stirred up the crowds that they really beat the tar out of them. So, so the crowd's very fickle. But Paul was a strong enough leader. After they had misunderstood what he's saying and called him Zeus and Hermes, he calmed him back down. Um, but again, the Jews came and persuaded the crowd, and then they nailed they nailed Paul. So I like this verse twenty one. They returned to Lystra. Lysa, Lystra, they're backtracking now, was where he was stoned. So so, and then to Iconium, that's where he fled from the threat of stoning. And then to Antioch, where he was driven out. I mean, do you ever feel unwelcome as a Christian, as a Christian witness in someone's life? Paul just got stoned and driven out and threatened to stone. And now he's going, OK, Barnabas, let's go back to all those cities and, and, and revisit them. I mean, that's unbelievable to me. Paul doesn't take no for an answer. He doesn't care about the people who don't love God. He cares about the people who do love God. And he's going back, it says, to uh, encourage them. Paul, even, he doesn't care about being stoned. He cares about the people of God. And to me as a pastor, that is so powerful. Because pastors could get selfish or think that, oh, this is hard, or what are they going to say, or what are they going to do? You know, this guy's mother doesn't want him to be a Christian. She's threatening things. But, but as a pastor, to go back into the lives of the people who are newly saved, go back. We just had a wonderful baptismal service with nine people being baptized, young people, getting out of high school and all the rest. And I want to go back into their lives and make sure they're safe and make sure they're cared for by a pastor. And that's what Paul was doing. And uh, I think that's then then. So he goes around further and then his first missionary journey comes to an end. Like Josh said, first full circle. Now 
in the next chapter, he's got to talk with the leadership and straighten out everything that he did. <laughs> he, has to, he has to stand before them and say, okay, look, this is what happened. And he's got to, and we always got to work with leadership after the Holy Spirit works, after God is working and we get ourselves into trouble and we get ourselves beat up, we go back to the leadership and say, okay, let's talk about this. And then the leadership understood. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. And so I'm um, looking forward to that. And maybe Paula, you could be ready with that too, to bring out some points. Um, I'm going to take that chapter. So wonderful. Josh, lead us in prayer in closing. All right. God, thank you so much for how you want to use us to preach your word, how you want us to be a part of ministering to people. God, I pray that you would continue to use us, God, as we yield to you. Would you would you take hold of us as a tool to bless other people? We give you the glory for everything that is done, every good thing, God, that we accomplish. Lord, we we say it is yours, that it was done by you, God, and we give it all to you. Yes, Lord, I pray Lord. that you would continue to move, continue to redeem when hard things come in our lives, Lord, or when people stand against us, God, would we be prepared for that? Would you prepare our hearts to, to face opposition and to love in the middle of it, God, to continue loving those people, even when they oppose us, God? I pray that you would continue to walk with us, and we thank you, God. We praise you for this story of Paul and Barnabas, how you moved through them and called them to do this. We thank you that you've called us and move through us. We give you praise in all this. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus' name, amen. Josh, take it from here. Bring them into the breakout room. Say goodbye. I'll be back in a minute. All right. God bless you guys. We're signing off now. So all of you take care, all of you who got to leave. And on YouTube, we love you guys. Have a blessed day. Bye-bye.